law number two. The second law of leadership is entitled the law of influence. And the law of influence says that the true measure of leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, this is a huge misconception in the lives of many people. Many people say, well, you know, leadership is title, leadership is position. I'm here to share with you today that as you study this law, you're going to find out that leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. The classic example of that, the classic example of this wonderful law is is Lady Di and the royal family in England. Uh, remember, remember when the marriage fell apart and, and so Lady Di was separated and divorced? Now, now, just think with me for a moment. Every one of you in this room can answer this question. Who had the most influence? The royal family with the palaces and the titles and the crowns and the thrones and the scepters and the tight positions or Lady Di who had the influence Lady Di had it absolutely see this is a great example of the fact that leadership is influence nothing more nothing less in fact my favorite leadership proverb is he that thinketh he leadeth and hath no one following him is only taking a walk. <laughs> and I know all kind of people, don't you? Taking walks. Huh? They have the title, they have the position, but there's nobody following them. This is an incredible law to begin to learn. As one of my friends told me one time, John, the position doesn't make the leader, but the leader makes the position and there's a world of difference between those two you see all of our life guess what we've been taught all of our life we have been taught that leadership is title its position so so we go for that title we go for that position only to realize that once we're in that title and position that doesn't necessarily mean anybody's going to follow us now where did I learn this law I told you I've been learning this law, these laws for over 20 years. I learned this law in my first church in Hillham, Indiana. Now, let's first of all think about it. Hillham, Indiana. 11 houses, two garages, one country store. That's Hillham. That's where I started. You've not been to Hillham. You've not heard of Hillham. You don't want to go to Hillham. If you do go, you won't know that you did go to Hillham. <laughs> old building, church building, over 100 years old, roof side, walls bowed. First Sunday, only three of us in attendance, and two of them were my wife and me. It was my wife, Margaret, myself, and an old lady who lived by the church by the name of Maud. It was Maud, Margaret, and me. First Sunday, three people. We could have put our whole church in a telephone booth <laughs> and had room for visitors. Now, I didn't know anything about leadership back then. If I had known anything about leadership back then, I would have voted on everything I want to see pass. <laughs> Thought about voting, but I wasn't sure where my wife Margaret stood on a couple of issues. <laughs> I could see myself losing two to one. I go to my first church board meeting. Now, I'm talking about just a handful of country, rural, conservative people. Okay? Get the picture. Now, I don't know what to do at this first board meeting because I wasn't trained to do anything about a board meeting. I just graduated second in my college class, and I never had a class on how to have a board meeting. Why would they want to teach me something helpful and practical and life change? <laughs> so I'm kind of intimidated as I go to my first board meeting, and Margaret, my wife, knows that, and so she kind of prays for me. I go to my first meeting, and I, I have a prayer time, and then I look out at this board, this just handful of people, and I didn't know what to do, so I said, well, does anybody have anything on their heart? As soon as I asked that question, there was a, a farmer in the church by the name of Claude who stood up. 
And, and Claude stood up and he said, well, yeah. He said, there are a couple things that I have on my heart. And he shared it with me. And, and what was so slick is everything that Claude said, there was a guy sitting right beside him by the name of Benny. And Benny seconded everything Claude said. So Claude would say it, Benny would second, and everybody said, I. And after a while, Claude said, well, he said, I think we're done tonight, preacher. He said, you can close in prayer. And I said, well, I'm, I think I will. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I went home that night. Margaret looked at me and said, well, how'd it go, honey? I said, oh, sweetheart, no problem. No problem. I said, I only need two people, God and Claude. And if I said I'd only get one, I'd like to have Claude because he's the one who shows up the most around here. Now, like I said, Claude was a farmer. About a week before the next board meeting, I called him on the phone. I said, Claude, can I come down and kind of do the chores with you around the farm? Can we, can we just kind of walk around the farm? And, and I said, while we're doing the chores, I'd like to talk to you about the church. He said, well, preacher, he said, I'd love for you to come down. And he said, sure, I would love that. So I went down that day. We did the chores around the farm. And while we did the chores, we talked about the church. I'd say things like, you know, Claude, the front door on the church. Paint is just cracking and peeling off of that. I said, visitors, when they walk up that, that walk, the first thing they see is that door. That's, it's a terrible sight. I said, what do you think we ought to do? Well, he said, it seems to me like we ought to take off the old paint and put a fresh coat of paint on that door. I said, I, I like that. I like that. <laughs> I said, Claude, would you mind... Would you mind next Tuesday night at the board meeting bringing that up to the church board? Oh, he said, sure. He said, I'll take care of that. I'll take care of that. I said, Claude, right behind the, right behind the platform area, we have three rooms and three, they're really, little, just real little rooms. And then the one on the right, we have a Sunday school class. The one on the left, we have a Sunday school class. And both of those are full. Then we got this one in the middle that we, we, well, we got a bunch of junk in there. We got last year's manger scene and a whole bunch of stuff in there. And I said, uh, but we're, we're already full in those other two classes, and we really need to have another class. What are we going to do? Well, I said, I think we ought to take the stuff out of that middle class and start another Sunday school class. I said, I like that. I said, Claude, would, would you mind next Tuesday night just bringing that up to the board? Oh, he said, I'll take care of that. I'll take care of that. It's no problem. I said, Claude, have you been down in the basement of the church? He said, what do you mean? Well, I said, there's a couple inches of water down there. Frogs are hopping around. And <laughs> crawdads are crawling around. I said, we can't have any kind of functions down there at all because of the water down there. He said, well, that's ridiculous. He said, we need to clean all that up. I said, well, I think so too. And I said, would you please? Oh, he said, oh, I'll take care of that. I'll take care of that. Next to Tuesday night, board meeting, I opened in prayer. I looked out and said, uh, does anybody have anything on their heart? <laughs> Claude stood up, said, preacher, I got a long list here tonight. This is going to take a little while. He said, you might as well sit down. I said, well, I think I will. So I looked at the board and said, have any of you noticed the front door in our church? He said, personally, I'm ashamed. <laughs> He's, he asked, what do, you, what do you think visitors think when they walk up that walk? First thing they see is that door. He said, we need to get off the old paint. We need to put a fresh coat of paint on. He said, we need to do it before Sunday so we can have a freshly coated painted door. Benny looked at him and said, I second that, Claude. That's a great idea. And everybody said, I. <laughs> Claude said, I'll tell you something else. He said, we got those three rooms behind the platform there. The one on the right's got a class. The one on the left's got a class. Those are both full. We need to start another Sunday school class. We need to clean out that middle room. And he looked back at Maxine Wilson and said, Sister Maxine, he said, I'd like you to be the Sunday school teacher. He said, I've heard you substitute. And he said, you do a good job. Especially, he said, when you have one of them there quarterlies, he said, you do a real good job teaching. He said, I'll get you a quarterly. And he said, I, my wife, and I'll be the first two pupils in your classroom. And I'd like you to start teaching next Sunday morning. I look back at Maxine Wilson, big old tears coming down her cheeks. And she said, well, Brother Claude, said, oh, if you think I can do it, I'll do my best for you and for Jesus. And Benny said, I second the idea. And everybody said, I.
Benny said, have any of you been in the basement of our church? He said, you need hip boots down there. Frogs are hopping around and crawdads are crawling around. He said, we need to clean up that. He looked at Ab Legendar and said, Ab, you bring your truck on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. Leon, you bring yours. I'll bring mine. He said, let's bring a couple of the neighbors around our area. Let's have them help us. He said, we'll start at 8 o'clock by noon on Saturday. That basin will be cleaned up for Sunday morning. Benny said, that's a great idea. Claude, I second it. And everybody said, ah. God looked at me and said, well, preacher, I think we're done tonight. He said, you can close in prayer. And I said, uh, I think I will. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I had the privilege of pastoring that little country church for three years and three months. And about one week before every monthly board meeting, I'd call Claude on the phone. And I'd go down to the farm, and we'd do the chores together, and we'd talk about the church. Not one time in those three years and three months did I ever personally bring any item to the church board. Claude did it every time. <laughs> I can still remember when I was leaving the church, I was a college friend of mine was going to follow me, and so... We sat down at the Villager Inn, a little restaurant there, and, 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 and I, I shared with him. I said, okay, um, let me tell you how I've done this. And I said, this is a great church to start in. These people are country people, but they've loved me, and I, it's been wonderful, and it's been a great experience. We've grown from three people the first Sunday. To we had days over 300. And I shared with him the Claude story, just like I shared with you. But instead of enjoying it like you've enjoyed it, and instead of laughing and, and sensing the influence issue like I've known you've sensed it, the longer I talked to him about it, the more irritated he became. And pretty soon, he's sitting at the edge of his seat in that booth at the Villager Inn, and, and he's pounding the desk between us. And he said, listen to me, John, listen to me, listen to me just a second. He said, that's maybe the, way, maybe the way that you did it when you were here. But he said, let me tell you right now that when I become the pastor of this church, I'm going to become the leader of the church, not and I sat back in my booth in the villager inn and I said to myself self you're looking at a stupid man <laughs> going to heaven yes Stupid? Absolutely. <laughs> and sure enough, that's what he did. He did that. He came into the church and he told Claude, he said, Claude, I want you to know right now, I'm the leader of the church. And Claude put his arm around and said, God bless you. I'll be fine. He lasted 10 months. In fact, they told me that on one Sunday morning, Claude came up to him, put his arm around him and said, Today would be a good day for you to resign. <laughs> you know, my friend never has learned this law. In 30 years of ministry, I'll guarantee you he's been in at least 15 different positions. He's never understood that leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. And you may say, well, John, I don't like that law. I, I, I'm the pastor of the church. I ought to be the leader. I'm the godly man. Well, whoop-de-doo. <laughs> when you're done believing all those lies about yourself, I'm here to tell you the person with the most influence in your church or in your business or in your company is the leader of the church. And nowhere is leadership more clearly defined than in a volunteer organization. Let me talk to you about this for a second. In fact, I was just up in uh, Michigan recently doing a, a, a conference for about 150 CEOs. And they were asking me, they were saying, John, how can I find leaders? How can I, know, how can I know my potential leaders in my companies? And I shared with them, I said, if you really want to know, if you really want to know your potential leaders, if you really want to find out in your company the ones that are really good leaders, I said, let them be put in charge of a voluntary organization. 
Let them be put in charge of a group of people that there's no paycheck to be given, there's no position to be hoarded over them. In other words, they don't have to follow you unless they want to follow you. See, the best way to test a leader is to ask them to lead a volunteer organization. That's when you're going to find out. That's when you're going to find out if they're good leaders or not. You see, if, if, if you're giving somebody a paycheck, of course they're going to follow you. If you have some kind of position over them, if you're the, if you're the top in your ranks in some kind of armed services, of course they're going to salute you. and Of course they're going to follow you. You've got more stripes on your arm than they do. That's not leadership. Life isn't a hut, two, three, four, hut, two, three, four, hut, two. That's not life. That's why you and I need to learn how to influence people. We need to know how, we need to know who has influence in an organization. We need to know how to influence people. That's why I wrote a few years back the book Becoming a Person of Influence because I wanted to help people understand how to influence people because if you know how to influence people, you know how to lead people because the person that's the largest influencer in the group is the leader of the pack. Let me take, oh, I don't know, five minutes and just walk you through the five levels of leadership or the five levels of influence in your notebook. The lowest level of all is the position level. And right beside the word position, put the word rights, R-I-G-H-T. People follow you because they have to. That's the entry level of leadership. That's where it all begins. And there's nothing wrong with that level as long as we understand that it's the entry level of leadership. As long as we understand it's the beginning, not the end. Does this make sense? But there's a level higher than that. The second level is the permission level. And beside the word permission, put the word relationships. Because on this level, people follow you because they want to. Now you can already see a marked change. On level number one, they followed you because they had to. On level number two, now they're following you because they want to. I sometimes call this level the second mile level. And the reason I call it that is because in the Bible, remember the story of, uh, well, any time that somebody asked you to go the first mile with them, you were obligated. But if you went the second mile, it was because you desired to go the second. That, that's, that's a second mile level of leadership and a second mile level of influence right there. The third level of influence in any company or any organization is the production level. And the key word right beside production, the key word is the word results. Here people follow you because of what you've done for the organization. It's a great level to be on. By the way, just like level number two is what I call the second mile level, this level here, I call this the high morale level. High morale kicks in here because people are now seeing success and they're, they're feeling growth and they're excited about what's happening and they're describing you in terms like, you know, before you came, Pastor, the church was going down, but now we've turned around and we've added 50 people to the church or the finances are up or, or the business has turned around. They describe you in those kind of terms. Here's how they describe you. Before you came, it was not as good as it is now. High morale kicks in on level number three. People begin to feel good about who they are and about what the company is doing. And they're following you because of what you have done for the organization. Now I want to stop here just for a second before I take you to the fourth level and say this. That in the business world and in the Christian, the church world, level number one is both highly regarded, the position or the title. In the church world, on level number two, the permission side, they, they, hold, they hold highly to relationships. The business does too, but not as highly. But the business world loves number three. That's the production. That's where the, the bottom line is, and that's where the profit margin is, okay? But here's what is interesting to me. When you get to level number four, I don't find very many churches or businesses really working level number four and level number four is the most important level it's called the people development level 
Here is where you are developing people. In fact, the word to put in that blank besides people development is reproduction. This is where growth really kicks in. In fact, we're going to teach a couple of the 21 laws. Deal with level number four, especially the law of explosive growth. We'll talk about that later. But on law number four, oh, this is, or level number four, this is exciting. This is where you're beginning to develop people. And just like level number two is where the second mile principle is lived out. And level number three is where high morale is beginning to be experienced. On level number four, the key word at this level is loyalty. People become loyal to you because of what you have done for them. That is a key area. In fact, I can promise you, when you start developing people, they're yours for life. Absolutely, one-on-one, -on -one, developing, pouring your life into them, discipling them. My friend and prayer partner, Bill Klassen, taught me many, many years ago. He said, John, you build a great church one person at a time. You don't build a great church from the pulpit. You build a preaching station from the pulpit. You build a great church one life at a time. People development. That's the fourth level of influence. The fifth level of influence is what I call the personhood level. The personhood level, I guess the key word there is respect. Because you have done it so well for so long with so many that you're bigger than life to them. They, they've got you up probably on a pedestal, okay? Now, I would encourage you, I've just given you a very short setting and teaching of the, the five levels of, of leadership and the five levels of influence, but I want to really encourage you, you can come back to this and look at this and, and study this and, and, and really uh, apply it to your heart and apply it to your life. Okay, four questions to ask ourselves on this law of influence. Question number one, what is the level of my influence with the leaders of my organization. I want you to sit down and I want you to think of who the leaders are in your company, in your church. And I want you to write those names down. Then I want you to ask yourself, okay, on these five levels, which level am I on with them? Now let me, let me, give, you a, let me give you a little bit of a hint here. You're not going to be on the same level with every person. Does that make sense? But what you want to do is make sure that you are really climbing the level of influence with your leaders because they're going to make you or break you. Question number two, what is the level of my influence with the followers of my organization? Let me stop here for a moment. If your level of influence is higher with the followers than with the leaders, you're in trouble. Because the leaders are going to influence the rest. You want to be able to turn that around. And because I don't have time in this lecture to give that to you again, the video kit, the five levels of leadership is key in understanding in depth the teaching I'm giving you right now. Number three, who are the top ten influencers of my organization? Sit down and say, okay, who are the top ten influencers in my congregation? Who are the top ten influencers in my company? That's a, that's a great exercise. For example, at Hillham, Indiana, the top influencer at Hillham, Indiana wasn't John Maxwell. The top influencer in Hillham was who? Claude was the top influencer. Benny was probably number two, huh? You say, well, John, where were you? I don't know. I think I started off about seven or eight and probably got up to about, I don't know, three by the time I left. I never was the top influencer. In fact, I was giving this lecture one time and Claude's son happened to be hearing this lecture. He came up to me after and gave me a big hug and he said, Dad still runs the church. <laughs> of course he does. Of course he does. He's the top influencer. When I went to my second church, I wasn't the top influencer there. When I went to the third church, I wasn't the top influencer there. I've never gone anywhere where I was the top influencer. You see, that's why it's so important to understand influence because that's how you lead. You don't lead through structure. You lead through influence. Number four, this is a great question. Do I influence the influencers? Great question. 
Do I influence the clods? And by the way, it may not be a clod in your church. Maybe it's a Claudia. Okay? But do I influence the influencers? Here's what I know about the success of your leadership right now. Listen carefully. Your ability to influence the influencers will determine your ability to grow the organization. If you can influence the influencers, you'll grow the organization. If you cannot influence the influencers, you could have real problems. There are four resources that I would encourage you to look at that will help you again with the law of influence. I did a Maximum Impact Club tape called Taking an Influence Inventory. What that does is this tape helps you to, to look at your own influence level, and basically it helps you to understand what your influence quotient was. And by the way, let me stop here for a second, because this is a workbook, this is a notebook, this is a tool, this is a resource, an aid to help you. What I would suggest that you do is we kind of go through these resources, and as I go through these laws, if there's one that you just say, I, I, I need to remember to get that just take your check mark and put a check beside the one that you want to come back to so when you review these lessons you say okay I wanted to get that tape or I wanted to get that book this will help me in my leadership development then there's the five levels of leadership then there's the book or in fact two books I wrote one becoming a person of influence which teaches you ten ways to influence people and then be a people person a book that I wrote in the 1980s that helps you understand how to connect relate and deal with the people. 